this is gonna be one of the best Carnage stories that we've ever covered on my YouTube channel. But the first thing we have to do here is talk about Flash Thompson. Bear with me, this is going to become incredibly important by the time we get to the end of this. So one of the things to know is that in the current Carnage comic right now, and if you need to get caught up, there'll be a playlist at the end of it, in effect, Carnage had gone through, killed different gods and things like that, and got rid of all the weaknesses. But he was kind of challenged on whether or not he was actually a god. And so what he had done is he had come back to Earth and started killing people in a certain kind of pattern. Now, some of you guys called it and actually realized that the names of the people that he was taking out were all religious apostles. And there's a reason for that. It has somewhat to do with the idea of godhood, but there's a bigger thing going on. In effect, Flash Thompson, anti-Venom, has been hot on the trail trying to understand the bigger picture here. And one of the things that he does as he's looking over all this evidence is he receives a note. And this note is basically kind of bloody design of the Grendel, right? The spiral from the King in Black and all that kind of stuff. In effect, it's kind of a way of basically saying that Carnage is looking to become the new King in Black, right? By kind of bringing this sort of evidence back in. So what Flash Thompson does is he takes it to Liz Allen, the CEO of Alchemax. Now she's kind of morally ambiguous if we're being honest with ourselves, but in this instance, she's really more of a person that can actually go over the sample itself analyze the blood and then give him information. Because the idea is this blood, or at least if there is any information there, will contain a clue as to the next target of carnage. And so when he gets back in contact with Liz Allen, she says two things. The first is that the blood stain is from at least 13 different people. And she says, we've managed to identify most all of them. And so far, all but two are victims of Carnage's alleged murdering spree. And so when Flash asks, who are the two others? She says, one is a man called John Statler Baker and the other is you. And so they don't know if Flash Thompson is a target, which it wouldn't make any sense lining up with the motive of Cletus because Flash's name is not the name of an apostle, right? Like Flash, the apostle of Jesus. It doesn't quite work that way. But the other possibility here is that it implicates Flash. So now it's as much of an investigation to clear his name as it is tracking down Carnage. Now, having said all of that, right? Let's get into the cool stuff. So what this does is it picks up with Carnage himself. Now, one of the things to remember is that when Carnage came back to Earth, he took on the physical appearance of Cletus Cassidy. But one of the things to remember is the Carnage symbiote and Cletus Cassidy himself have actually been separated for quite some time. And so in this video, the Carnage symbiote, which we'll just call it the symbiote from this point going forward, that it actually comes back into contact with Cletus. But one of the things the symbiote does as it's making its way through is it's chasing down this guy. And it's got this amazing monologue. By the way, the monologues over the course of this are gonna be phenomenal, right? He says, every serial killer believes they are God. Maybe not the God, but when you claim someone's life, when fear consumes them, when they know that everything that stands between life and death is your will, you are their God. And the reason why is because we often attribute the indiscriminate loss of life to some kind of a God, right? A man's walking across the street, he gets hit by a car. Well, it must have been his time according to God's plan, if you believe in that sort of thing. And so people try to find logic and reason or try to find some kind of greater understanding. And in fact, that's one of the things that the symbiote's gonna hit on here in a little while. And so when people consider this idea that like a being is coming for them and he's going to destroy them, that in that moment, because they control life and death, they are in effect, God. And so this dude gets taken out. Now, the thing here is that continuing on, right? The symbiote says, scratch the surface and you reveal the real world, all red and raw and senseless. Now, one of the things that you will notice here is that it does kind of address itself in the sense that technically speaking, the red haired Cletus Cassidy that you see is more just kind of like a physical form created by the symbiote, but it is in effect the symbiote talking to itself and answering itself, right? So we can just kind of assume that's the case going forward, but literally it's just kind of like, what's bothering you, right? And the symbiote says, I, that's to say the previous me have been alive all along, yet this is the best that he could do. And the symbiote says, we are better now. We are more powerful. And it's like, perhaps. And it says, but he, the other one, he is a loose thread. And I would like 
to pull it. And the question's asked, do you think he would stand in our way? To which the response is given, nothing can stand in our way, my love, I am the end of the world as we know it. Now, this is where things get cool because technically you could argue the symbiote is going to eradicate all life on earth, which would seem way too simple. The reality here is far more interesting than that, right? The symbiote kind of asks this question, muses this question, right? What's the difference between a madman and a prophet, right? Imagination, branding, a pair of good robes, I could kill everyone in here right now. And the question is asked, why don't we? And the response, the same reason a benevolent God does not wipe away all illness and pain, I suppose. And so the question's, but why didn't he? And the answer isn't really given, right? It's, I can smell him. He was here, this chair. Every time he'd come here, he'd sit right here. Here's another question. What came first, the carnage? or the anger. So it's a really, really interesting kind of quagmire because it brings into sharp relief the nature of like how we see gods and how they function in the world, right? Why doesn't a benevolent God get rid of all illness and all disease and all that kind of stuff, right? Is it a place of testing? Right? Like, why do places like hell exist? Right? Using the Stephen Hawking quote, was God making hell for people who ask such questions? That's the kind of thing that's just really sort of thrown in here. And so, what you do is you pick up with basically the symbiote heading in a particular direction. And this is where things get cool, right? The question is, why are we driving, right? The answer, why do pilgrims walk, right? Is it this spiritual journey? And it's like, well, you know, it's, it's something like that. But they end up coming across this guy who's just sort of holding a sign and is effectively a hitchhiker. They end up picking him up and there's no real indication as to whether or not the symbiote's gonna kill this guy. That's one of the big differences between like uh, the Joker and the Carnage symbiote. The Joker would kill you just for inconveniencing him, right? Like that's literally reason enough. Sometimes there's no reason at all because it just makes for good sport. But when it comes to someone like Carnage, it's usually to serve a particular purpose, even if it's for no other purpose than to sow chaos and to reap madness out there in the world, that is still a purpose. And so what you do is you pick up with a conversation between these two guys. And this guy is basically a buffoon, right? He says, and it's all done by hand. 37 years, he worked on this stone monument. Some say he was crazy. And the simian is just getting more and more annoyed with this guy, right? The question is asked, tell me, in your opinion, what is the difference between a madman and a prophet, right? That's the, that's the question the symbiote asks, right? This guy responds, great question, my man. I think like a prophet speaks like divine truth, like their soul is touched by the divine. The guy's kind of has no real idea what he's talking about. And he talks like an idiot, right? You know, but like if you speak your truth, right, from the heart, then you're like a prophet for the universe, you know? Like it can never be madness. It's, it's just, this guy is just a total goof. And so in this moment, like things just get more and more irritating until this guy says, sometimes I think like if I wrote a book, like the book of Mark, where I tell my truth, like my experiences, I would live forever. And that's when the symbiote realizes this guy's name is Mark. He fits perfectly in line with the number of apostles that have been taken out. The symbiote kills this guy, literally drives off a cliff and tears this guy in half while they're doing it. In the midst of it all, they end up in new market. And the reason for this is that as the symbiote's kind of musing to itself with just some victim in tow that he just kind of sits up against a bus bench, which is just kind of brutal, right? Kind of weird. That he starts talking to himself. He kind of starts musing to himself. He says, we came here on our first St. Estes field trip, the St. Estes orphanage where Cletus Cassidy was originally raised. And it says it would, well, technically raised after he killed his mom, I think it was. I don't remember the, the uh, specifics of his origin story. Throw it down in the comments. He says it would, as it turned out, also be our last. It was sponsored by some socialite who wanted to do just enough to save herself a space in heaven. And then this disembodied voice comes out of nowhere. Could have gotten us central heating, but she wanted to parade her welfare around. The poor orphans. The symbiote responds back. We stopped at this place for ice cream. Townspeople smiled placidly, all pity and discomfort. They spoke to us slowly, enunciating every simple word with determination. The shop had every flavor in the world, but they served us 
and then this disembodied voice comes in again, Charity with a sprinkle of content. The symbiote speaks up as it makes its way down into the sewers. There was a boy, Jonas or Jan or something. Pathetic creature had this unhealthy obsession with screws. This voice comes back, we called him Phillips. He never understood why the half-wit. The response of the symbiote collected them, old rusty screws and nails, kept them in a box under his bed, counted them every night. The voice comes back, we stole some. From time to time, removed one, put it back weeks later, drove him up the walls. The symbiote chimes in again. This is one of the coolest like back and forth that I've ever seen in comics, right? The symbiote says, I remember he said, as he gobbled up the singular scoop of ice cream that we were given, this person responds that the sewers in Newmarket were probably nicer than our rooms at St. Estes. And this is when the symbiote says, in the years to come, I would find out that he was quite right. I have a question for you, old man. This guy, Cletus Cassidy, the one who can alter reality in a localized space, right? This guy says, then ask. The symbiote says, what's the difference between a madman and a prophet? What does Cletus say? The audience, right? It's one of the coolest things, the coolest back and forth here. Because when that happens, and this is where things get a little bit murky, when that happens, you basically have the two of them engaging in a conversation. Now, here's what we don't know about Cletus Cassidy as he exists now. Cletus having the ability to alter reality was less due to his ability to control the molecular structure of matter and more due to the fact that he had taken on a symbiote of its own and then literally used the power of the symbiote to kind of erect a house. So anytime anybody walked into that house, he could change it, he could shape it, he could make it anything that he wanted it to be. The question here is, is that what's going on here? And the answer seems to be no. And you'll see what we're talking about as time goes on. But it's just kind of like this really, really cool back and forth, right? Because the symbiote asks, and can you judge a god by their audience? The response of Cletus, let's bloody well hope not for the sake of the gods. And so then he asks, is that what this is about? Would you like to be a god or would you like to be a god butcher? And the question of the symbiote, would it not take one to do the other? And that's kind of the question that we found ourselves asking, right? In the previous Carnage run, when you had Ram V kind of writing everything, it was in a lot of ways like the Carnage symbiote traveling throughout the multiverse, going into the death of the Venomverse, and it was killing all these different Venom symbiotes across the multiverse. It was absorbing their power, which in turn eliminated that weakness, right? He could, for example, kill one of the Venoms that was immune to fire, and that in absorbing that Venom's power, Power, now Cletus is immune to fire or the symbiote's immune to fire. It was that kind of a thing. But then suddenly it just stopped at the very beginning of this Venom run. And in the first issue, it established that he was trying to achieve legitimate godhood. He already had it in terms of power. He was trying to achieve it in terms of perception. Because what you end up doing here is you have this moment where Cletus leads the symbiote, right? As they're kind of talking back and forth, going back and forth, a little bit of banter, that what ends up happening is Cletus says, now Carnage, my sweet little puppy, don't be mean. And what he does is he basically opens a gas line fills the entire room with natural gas and lights a butane lighter, which the whole room immerses into flames, right? So we get this really cool thing. First come the flames, and that's when Carnage is like, that was your plan? Then comes the fury, right? What do you think fire will do to me? I expected more from you, Cletus. And that's where Cletus is like, and I from you. What does it say about you, God Butcher, if you cannot even kill an old man? And that's when Carnage is like, it takes more than flames to stop me, Cletus, and literally devours Cletus Cassidy. But in that moment, something goes wrong, right? Like he literally starts hacking and coughing and all that kind of stuff and ends up spitting up Cletus Cassidy and his entirety. And what we end up finding out is that Cletus had this genius idea that what Cletus did is he basically used concentrated antibodies. He injected himself with that. It was the closest he could get to anti-venom because basically Flash Thompson as anti-venom has the ability to neutralize other symbiotes. At least that seems to be the case we don't know how his powers are going to stack up to the new abilities of Carnage. And so Cletus literally says, I thought it would kill you, but you were as hard to kill as me. Tell me, Carnage, if we are the gods, 
who were the devils. Now, regarding the bigger role of Carnage, right, the bigger goal that he's trying to achieve, because it's one thing to start going around and taking people out who all have the names of the apostles, but what's the bigger plan here? What we end up finding out, at least from Flash Thompson's perspective, is that there is a video that surfaces online where a guy is tracked down whose name is John, and he's shot at. Now, as we know, Carnage doesn't use guns, right? They're too quick. You can't savor all the little emotions, you know? But no, quite literally, like he never uses guns. <laughs> and so Flash Thompson figures out quickly, this is a copycat, right? Because with Cletus going around, everyone named Mark, he kills. Everyone named John, he kills, right? Anyone who's named after an apostle, he kills. And because there are people out there who are just obsessed with carnage, if for no other reason than reasons that make sense to nobody but themselves, they ultimately ended up copying his actions. But the bigger goal of carnage here was to build a religion. Because one of the things he learned in his time traveling the multiverse is that when it comes to gods like Thor and Odin and even like Gore the God Butcher, they're only as powerful as the people or the number of people who believe in them. Of what use is a god that has no followers, that never prays to them, right? It's one of the big things that was established in Jason Aaron's run on Thor. It was continued in Donny Cates' run, and it's something that's being maintained here. The power of gods derives from prayer. What better way to become a true god and all the power that comes with it, in addition to the power he already has, than to actually incite a movement in his name, that people will start seeing him as a god and start worshiping him as a god and acting in a way that would earn the favor of Carnage himself. And so switching back over to the symbiote itself, right? Kind of taunting Cletus a little bit, asked the question like, does it hurt? And the response of Cletus, absolutely it does, right? Of course, that's when the symbiote says, good, your antibodies are but a temporary inconvenience. Had it been anti-venom, it would have been another matter, at least for now. Now, that's one of the things to know is because, again, this continues on the exact same thing that's been happening over the course of the entire Carnage series. Because Cletus Cassidy has basically injected himself with concentrated antibodies, if the symbiote consumes him, the symbiote will be immune to anti-venom. You guys see how it all comes together, right? Like you see how it all comes together, that the symbiote is basically becoming this unstoppable force. It's immune to fire, it's immune to sonics, it's immune to all the traditional weaknesses of a symbiote. The one thing it was not immune to was the power of anti-venom. We found that out during the story of the death of Venomverse, right? Anti-venom was the one thing that could stop Carnage. So what better way than to take a detour from his entire conquering of the multiverse in an attempt to basically kill Eddie Brock Venom and become the new king in black of the universe and like take out Cletus Cassidy or somebody and then find an immunity to anti-venom itself. And so that's exactly what he does. He literally slices off the top of the head of Cletus Cassidy, consumes his brain, and in doing so, becomes immune to anti-venom. Now, here's where things get wild, right? Remember what we said earlier, that Flash Thompson was basically told that one of the blood samples belonged to a guy named John. Flash Thompson goes on a mission to find this guy and to try to rescue this guy. And so what he does is he shows up in this location, right, where Cletus Cassidy, right, the symbiote who's now absorbed or killed Cletus, we can just start calling him Carnage again, right, to kind of keep things clear, that Carnage is basically making his way, right? He's essentially out. And he's the one that's actually giving us this monologue here, right? He says, I was prepared to wait, but he, which is to say Flash Thompson, is right on time. Flash does his best imitation of an ordinary man. The symbiote disguises him well, gives him a costume, changes his fingerprints, shrinks his muscles into a non-threatening frame, right on time, right? And that's where he says like, this is the place, everything looks fine. And that's when Carnage says, in a world of disappointment, Flash Thompson is not disappointing because this is the address of John. And Carnage says his symbiote ears will hear what no one else does, muffled and far away, yet still there. He will smell the faint scent of feces and blood, and he will want to do the right thing himself. And oh, how I love 
a hero because when he comes across this door, right? It just says, live, love, laugh, written in blood, which is exactly what Carnage would have done back during the early Maximum Carnage days. But he hears John literally tied up in the basement, screaming for help. But when Flash gets there, he flips on the light switch. It turns out, it's a trap because as soon as the light switch gets turned on, John's head gets blown to pieces. Basically, Flash killed this guy. With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. I told you this story is phenomenal. It took three issues to get to a point where it matters, but it's amazing. If you guys need to get caught up on Carnage, make sure you click this link to the playlist, and I will catch you all in the next video. Peace.